waffles. As long as he's not sending he has, across the border to Mexico for the real sugar Pepsi down there. Sometimes as long as he, he can has get a U.S. source. Wagyu hamburgers. I'm not going to believe that they actually massage those cows. That they massage them. I was conflating it with Kobe beef from the original pampered cow at three times the price. That's a marketing ploy. I think. I had uh, Kobe beef in in Japan, and it wasn't that great. Hmm. I sometimes go into extra uh, restaurants and wonder if I can get my food with extra flavor enhancing chemicals. There's it's a lot of yeah. Well, there are a lot of good ones out there. You know, search nice out the run. Chinese food with MSG and all the rest of those things. Instant headache. Mm. Now, with Kobe, isn't it in addition to the pampering of the cow, is it the aging that's specific? Kobe, to it? Kobe is the location, so it's it's like Modena or Champagne, and so the cows have to be in a certain area in Japan, and then Wagyu is the type of beef. I have had right. Kobe in Kobe, and it was one of the great experiences of my life. There you go. It's it's not only are they a certain type of cow from that region, it's just the way they are treated and fed and rubbed and generally handled. And a piece of Kobe beef does not look like a piece of American beef. So it's when the... When the alien, when the AI overlords take over, maybe I won't move to Kobe and I can be pampered like that. Yes. I thought most of the American beef is actually from Australia. I don't know. That would be a little odd. I mean, most of the Kobe or, you know, the Wagyu yeah, is from I Australia. Could see that. I could see that. Yeah. Until you're just a, just a tweak hot. If you could just bang it down. I know you're tired of hearing me say it. He was excited to tell us about his Kobe experience. Well, I have uh, lowered myself on the volumination machine. I once resigned an account because it was for one of America's largest meat packers, and I just didn't want to sit there and look at the lines where that takes place day in and day out. And I was at a Fogo to chow last night, so I can't eat meat for another week. <laughs> You've reached your limit in one adventure. That could be a good second hour. Beat Deck is now called X Pro. X Pro. I got to admit, I've started seeing Elon's new logo show up in places, and it does look odd. I mean, I, I grant that it's recognizable, but boy. How many company vans are scraping off the bird and putting on the X right now? I know. I yeah, know. It's a shame he can't sign his name. <laughs> Thank you all for being here.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Great to have you here. If you've come here via YouTube and want to know more about what we do, head on over to officehours.global. That's our primary web portal for more information and links about the show. Our first hour, always a general discussion of production and IT-related topics where we answer audience-submitted questions. Our second hour, we take a little turn and usually do something that we focus on. Today, we're going to be welcoming Dan Pizarski to live uh, from LiveView to the show. Uh, we've been using LiveView remote units to to enable our, our remote coverage from the field during NAB Cinegear. And this week, we're going to be using uh, it once again to cover SIGGRAPH in LA. So it should be a fascinating second hour today. But this is our first hour, and we address audience questions. And so it's time to do that. Let's dive right in. Mitch, what's up first today? Thank you, Bill. First in, John Foltz from Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania, asking, what are the panelists' favorite ways to control productions? Stream Deck, Universe Control, Central Control, Isadora, Ross dashboard or even something else. Nigel Dessau is going to start us off today. Nigel? Well, good morning. Uh, from the very simple end, which I operate, I think the most effective control device I have is my mouse. I think from there I go to a keyboard. But in terms of the devices you talk about, Stream Deck. I use a, a two Stream Decks, one with companion, one without. And I, I really almost control all my daily actions from those two devices. Uh, and, uh, Alex? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I, I use a lot of stream decks. <laughs> I've got a lot of them personally in my personal space. Um, and um, but I, I will say that when I'm in production, production, uh, we use very we um, ex, you know we don't use a ton of these. We do use Isadora very heavily for the show. This whole show is driven by Isadora. So Isadora Mix Effect Pro um, with some universe da a dash of universe added to it. So um, so we use a little bit of all of those. And there's some stream decks. I'm sure part of that process. Um, but when I'm using, doing a lot of external stuff, a lot of times we're building something that is, that we have to change pretty constantly, um, getting ready for a show over a couple days. And so as a result, I tend to be very low level about things um, and try to not have a lot of those just because it takes, where I find they work really well is when I'm doing the same thing over and over again. If I start changing things a lot and having to reprogram them, um, I, I, get, I become a little bit more resistant to it um, and want to use just the, the hardware that, that is designed to do that. Yeah, I'm a little bit on Alex's side on this. I, I think I've talked about this so much, I'm famous for it. I use nothing but trackpads now. I haven't touched a mouse in many years. And the reason is specifically, I had a set of circumstances where I had to go and edit for other people. And the geometry of what's in front of me, my laptop, a large trackpad below and centered with that, I've gotten so used to that I want to recreate that. So even if I'm on a large desktop computer, I will get a magic trackpad and put it below my keyboard in the center because all my muscle memory is built around operating that system. And I find now the, taking my hand off the keyboard to toss it out to the right to a mouse over and over again seems alien to me. So I guess it just depends on what you get used to. I used one for 20 years, then I stopped, and I haven't gone back to it for the last 10 years, and that's just how I react to my systems. Alex, yeah, a follow-up? Yeah, and I think these systems work really well when you're doing, like, for instance, office hours is done in a fairly simple way every every day. And as a result, um, all these subsystems work really, really well. A lot of times for the kind of shows that I do on a, on a broadcast level, we're bringing lots of new people in, and they have the same problem that Bill has. If it's not just what, what it, if it looked like it. Now, we have some operators that will come in and immediately drop a stream deck and start, you know, start running things. And, and you know, they, and, and if that's how they do it, then we stay out of their way too. <laughs> so, so that's the, yeah. so, you know, you want to, you want to be uh, flexible and let people work in the way that they're most comfortable. Absolutely. I was on a big edit crew and uh, one of the guys was a tablet guy with a pen and he what, what, was not happy to edit until he had his tablet and his pen set up. So you get used to things and you just want it to be fluid and you want to be able to be productive and do your work right. And however you do that, as they say, you do you. Let's go to the next question. Simon Ray from Midlands, United Kingdom. Can the panel recommend a rental house that can send out a specified fly kit throughout the U.S.? And are there services available to deliver, set up, and retrieve the equipment looking to level up a guest for an event? Alex, you have a lot of experience in this. You know, there's some companies that will, um, I don't know of a lot of companies that just do the, the individual kits. There really should be. There's some folks that do kind of all-in-ones. You can open the box. It's pretty expensive um, to do that, um, but it, but there are some out there. Um, I know that there are there have been, um, I don't. I think a lot of us have hacked through some things that we send out. The real challenge is it really does want to be a pre-built kit 
and it needs to come with training on how to put it up. You're going to have to have support. You're going to have to have, you know, it's, and I don't know very many companies that are doing that as a service. It probably, probably something we should do. <laughs> we do a lot of, we have a lot of uh, setups, but I think also what happens is um, our setup keeps changing. You know, like we keep on upscaling or moving things around or making them efficient. I don't know if we have a lot of pre-built kits that stay the same. It feels like the kit changes every time we send it out. Chris Pennock. I happen to know that uh, in our community here that Jonas and Tucker for a while had built out a handful of kits that they were, um, that they were renting out. Ironically, I was talking to um, Jonas just, a, uh, I think it was last week, and uh, somebody hopped into a meeting we were in. I think it was Jack who just had his laptop and just was using the mic in his laptop and the camera in his laptop. And I said, Jack, what mic are you on? He goes, I'm just using the... I said, it sounds astonishingly good. And to, and Jonas said, we consider just sending MacBook Pros out as our kit. <laughs> like literally just use this, you'll be fine for what we need. But um, if you're looking for something, it, I don't know that they're still doing it, but it might be worth looking out to Tucker and Jonas on Discord. Alex? And also, I mean, you can contact us, at, contact me in Discord. I, you know, we have lots of kits <laughs> laying around, so, so we can, we may be able to do a one-off. I don't think we do it as a service um, necessarily, but if an office hours folks needed some a kit sent out, uh, we could probably figure that out as well. So, but Jonas and Tucker are also a good a good source for that. Um, so, um, so go ahead and contact contact us there. But we've got you know a, a literally a room full of kits at different sizes, <laughs> so so uh, uh, that we might be able to help you with the. Um, uh, I will say that the how a mic sounds, how the Mac MacBook sounds, I think is very dependent on the room. So what we found is that with the Macs, um, they sound really good. If the room is reasonably good, reasonably soft, regular living room, something like that, it doesn't feel like you need anything. If it's in a really hard room, it still has a little trouble uh, getting rid of the reverb. Simon, I hope that helped. Let's go. Next question. And here's Paul Wallace from Austin, Texas with a question. Please comment on the linear faders from P&G used in the Sound Devices CL16 linear fader 8 series control. Uh, the use case? Interesting. Mitchell, you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it says a lot about a company that puts P&G or Penny and Giles faders uh, in their equipment. A lot of times it's, a, uh, uh, it's an upsell, like you can optionally add them. But I've been using P&G faders for a very long time in recording uh, even I built a uh, recording console in 1978, and I put P&G in there. Here's the experience. You put your hand on a, a well-made device, and you move it if it has a mechanical ability. And on a P&G, just nothing comes close to that buttery feeling of adjusting that fader. So you don't have any skips. You don't have any zipper effects that you get when you have got, like, wires or other things that are in there. Those faders are made so well and are so great at doing what they do. I don't think there's anybody that's a close second or a third or a fourth. So anytime you have a chance to uh, to upgrade or use a uh, device that has PNG faders in it, especially sound devices, highly recommend it. It makes or breaks it. Alex? It's definitely on my bucket list of, oh, I, I'd really like to have one of those <laughs> for my Scorpio, but it's $6,000 for those. And the part of it is because of those, those uh, faders. I, totally worth it though. Like it, it is, uh, if I, if I did this every day, if I was, if I had a sound kit every day and I was doing uh, recording, I would absolutely have one. Um, it there, the quality is, I mean, of that whole CL 16 is incredible. Mitchell, you had a follow up. Yeah. They're butter. Yeah. That's the way we <laughs> explain it. <laughs> it's butter. All right. Next question. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana here in us, uh, overkill or just good idea. And there's a link to a cooling dock device. Uh, Nigel, experience? Uh, it looks to me like overkill. I think if I still had uh, an Intel-based MacBook, I think I'm, I might want to do this. But if you're still on an Intel-based MacBook, then you need to uh, really ask whether it's your production machine and if it is, why you haven't moved to a, an Apple Silicon. Uh, it, this feels like a device that was a really good idea about four years ago. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, my my experience with the new MacBook Air that I have in my 
studio uh, in the voice booth, it has it's fanless. It's one of the little ones, and it doesn't get terribly hot. I do think that their power versus uh, performance curve continues to go up and took a big leap during the Apple Silicon transition. So I'm not sure whether those kind of cooling docks that used to be, <laughs> boy, I've had some laptops that you put them on your bare legs in the summertime and you got to worry about at least a first degree burn or second, whatever the lowest level of burn is because they got hot. I don't experience that much anymore. Let's go to the next question. From Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking, what's the most accurate device to measure the surface temperature of your gear? A10 Mini, Melee, Insta360. Would one of these do the job? And there's a uh, a link in uh, somewhere to those little handheld devices. Yeah, there's a lot of those infrared thermometers. Alex, your experience. Fleur. <laughs> Fleur is the most accurate Fleur, way yeah. to do it. Yeah. So uh, you can get them for your phone. You can get them. You can get them. You ask for the most accurate, not the least expensive. <laughs> so so anyway, so the uh, the most accurate, it's not just the, the, the Fleur will give you a, it'll actually give you a video that's going to give you a real sense of what those temperatures are, but it also gives it to you in a resolution so that you're not just doing point, um, you're not, you know, gathering point information, you're gathering this is everything that I'm looking at there. And so when analyzing um, a series of components, it's a really, really powerful tool to, to use. Um, I had one that doesn't work now with my oh, and 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 Chris. Mr. Has Fenwick one. has one. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> no, this is just, this is Home Depot. Uh, I bought, the, Jack and I went camping uh, two weekends ago and he, Jack is very heat adverse. And um, we were going someplace where it was going to be very warm. And I literally bought this just for fun. It's like, oh, how hot is your hood? How hot is the pavement? And we were tracking the, the surface temperature where we were all day long and watching it go up. How it's, much does that cost you, Chris? It's, they're like 40 bucks or something like that. It's, yeah. it's Home Depot, Klein Tools. They have two. There's a forty dollar version one and a sixty dollar version one. I bought the. They only had the forty. I probably would have bought the sixty dollar one. They're, you can get ones for fourteen dollars on Amazon. I use, I use that one yeah. in my kitchen. I use those Klein? in my kitchen, not the client, yeah. but I, I don't think there's any difference there. So forty years ago, I had to do <laughs> a, some narration for like McDonnell three, Douglas on the Apache TAC helicopters and the forward-looking infrared radar, which is what the acronym is. Probably hundreds of millions of dollars to develop the technology, and that's interesting that now it's fourteen ninety-five at Home Depot. Fabulous. Well, the Fleur is uh, not. The Fleur is hundreds of dollars. It's it's uh, or you know it's but the um yeah those little ones are not expensive. Yeah. Well, you put it in a military machine, it gets pretty expensive pretty quick. I would bet. Anyway, let's move on. Next question. Matt Halverson from Brookings, South Dakota, South Dakota. Recommendations for an affordable wireless intercom system that I can use while roaming around our twenty thousand seat football stadium. We have a hardwired connection point by an end zone. But I'm wanting to go mobile and still communicate with the director. Mm, Alex, help him out. I mean, there's definitely very powerful ones, but they're not as affordable. So Clearcom, of course, has FreeSpeak. Bolero, Bolero is uh, Riedel's version of this. And both of those would be able to cover that stadium um, with, the, with the right rollout. But those are tens of thousands of dollars. If you want to do it affordably, um, probably what you're probably looking at is, I mean, because it's 20,000 feet, you really want to base it on your cell connection, not on some kind of other connection that you have there if you're, to do it affordably. And so that really puts you into... Um, uh, Clearcom's Agent IC, if you have a Clearcom system, or Unity. Um, you can have basically use Unity Connect um, and a couple of wiring, potentially Dante and other things, to tie it in to the wired system. Um, or you can use something, if you have, if, you, if it's already a Clearcom matrix, if you happen to be, if that's what you're using there, then there are ways to tie that into Agent IC. Um, those are licenses that you buy for the phones. You can, they're pretty easy to administer for the phones. And that's going to give you a cellular c connection. Um, I think that cellular is most likely what you're trying to do here, um, just because it's a lot of, that's a lot of space to try to cover any other way. Um, there are, again, as I said before, professional ways to do that, that, that are expensive, but a phone will get you around to a lot of places. A little more latency, a little less flexibility. Um, but if you're tying directly into a, uh, for instance, a Clearcom matrix, with clear with a uh, agent IC, there's a, most of those controls you get back. Uh, if you're doing it in Unity, you're going to be kind of limited to PLs um, to and 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 what you decide to feed in and out of there. Next question, Eric Price in Kansas City. He's asking after installing the ACO on my Windows 11 laptop, the PC sees the Mix Pre 6 
as a device, but no longer as an audio interface. Any idea why this might be or how to fix it? Must use Windows in this setting rather than my Mac. Uh, intermittent problems, and it should work, but it doesn't. Alex, help him out. My temptation would be to grind the machine down. <laughs> like, you know, like with a PC when something isn't working as it should, I, my, I have to admit that I just, I don't really, I just go, oh, it doesn't work. And then I, and, and with most computers, if, if it's not doing what I expect it to do, my knee jerk reaction is to grind it down. Like, it, you know, just, just, just uh, start over again, install everything. It takes an hour, hour and a half to do. And then it, 95% of the time comes back up if it's if it's a fairly normal thing. Because um, I find that when that's not working, it's usually a sign that there's a bunch of other little hooks that aren't there. And, and you know, it's not going to, I'm just going to keep chasing this. And so my kind of, this makes this go away is to start from the ground and just build back up again. Always a sensible last resort. Chris Fenwick, your thoughts? So, so Alex, to be clear, when you say grind it down, you don't mean put the whole PC in a wood chipper. Like far. Well, I would put the PC in the wood chipper, but <laughs> yeah, but the um, but but I think that he has hey to now. still use it. So so the um, so so I would say in this case, I would just say you're just going to reinstall the system from the ground okay. up. So I was I was curious as to the exact meaning of grind it down. Thank you. Yeah, ground ground up rebuild reboot. <laughs> Take it down to the nothing and build yeah. it piece by piece. Well, all right. Uh, next question. From Laura Thompson in Beaumont, Texas. Bill, is the Magic Trackpad more reliable than the Magic Mouse? Yes. I think anything on the planet as a peripheral is maybe more reliable than the Magic Mouse. Magic Mouse had a very, very checkered history. And in, in its defense, I think I used one back in those days for maybe a week. It was pretty fiddly. It had that little tiny knobby ball on the top, which was pretty useful for moving a cursor around. But it seemed like it just tried to do too much. And there were a whole bunch of things wrong with it. And nobody really likes the Magic Mouse. On the other end of the spectrum, the Magic Trackpad presenting itself as a slab of metal with a slight angle on your desk has always, for me, worked flawlessly no matter what Mac I attach it to. And I will take it a step farther and say, if you're using it, learn the multi-touch gestures because that has been absolutely transformative for you. There's a whole variety of things you can do with the Magic Trackpad in terms of a three-finger pinch or a three-finger swipe that do really useful things. And as you get to know how to do it, it just adds so much more efficiency. A lot of things that I used to have to use keyboard combinations and, you know, do put my hands into odd positions to get three keyboard controls on the left and then one tap on the right. Now it's just a matter of, uh, you know, two finger swipe this way gets it done. It's really useful. That's That's been my experience. Takes some getting used to because multi-touch is not natural for most people. So you have to kind of build your, your capabilities over time. But I love the thing. Chris Fenwick, your thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's really important to remember that there are many different ways that we can interact with our computers. Uh, Bill likes the, touch, the scratch and sniff pad. I think it's the most one of the most ridiculous tools ever, and yet he loves it. I I, I went on a one year quest to find the perfect mouse that fits my hand that does what I want. I love it. John has a John has the same mouse I do, and so does Nigel. I think. Yeah, I'm quite the influential mouse sales person. Uh, everybody's got. Yeah, that's a horrible <laughs> mouse, Mitchell. Um, but but it's important to remember there are many different ways, and you should try them all. And and something will click with you. And the problem is, is it may take a little while to get used to it. I understand how Bill got to where he he got. I still think it's ridiculous. Um, but uh, try the different things, and and uh, you may find that for what you do and how you're. And again, biology is part of it. You know, if your hand is too big, some of these mice just they they actually. If you think about it, they will cramp your hand because of the way you have to hold it. So find something that works for you. Mitch Hill. I have a problem trying to understand why the word magic has to be uh, describing the device. It's, it's not very quantifiable. It's not on the spec sheet. Um, it doesn't do magic things because if this was working right now, Chris would turn into a frog and it's just not working. Uh, what's the old line? Any technology that is sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. So maybe that's why they did it. I will say one thing. The, the, the turnover moment for me 
I had a thing where I was doing some training and I wanted an overhead shot. So I set up a camera over my computer. This was back in the day, many years ago. And when I came back, I was shuffling through that stuff and I noticed myself going. And that was my hand going out from my keyboard to my mouse 700 times during an edit session. And I went, that doesn't seem very efficient as opposed to a trackpad, like on a laptop that most of us use at some point, where moving from input to control is an inch, maybe a twist of the hand, and that's it. So in terms of pure ergonomic efficiency, that was one of the things that sold me on this. But I agree with Chris that everybody's different, and everybody should be able to pick the input device you like. But I would suggest trying this and see if it fits for you, because it's really efficient. Anyway, let's move on. Next question. Jack Rupel from Breckenridge, Colorado. The panel established that stereo video has been just a gimmick with the upcoming Vision Pro. Is it still a gimmick or is it just going through the motions until AR becomes a reality? Alex. I don't know how, I, don't, I guess I wasn't here when we established that, that stereo was a gimmick because I would definitely have not subscribed to that. So, so I, as someone who's done uh thousands of hours of stereo um uh, i think that it's a very compelling format and i think that it's it is it dramatically changes how you experience it it also means that you have to change how you do filmmaking uh, most filmmakers didn't do that they just did their film and then had somebody cut out little cardboard things um that, that put them on on planes and so that made it more of a gimmick but the when you actually shoot stereo um, it gives you another thing. Now we have to also get into there are other things that are missing. So, so the um, you know what's missing is higher frame rates, which we're going to start seeing with uh, the uh, the headset. So, thirty frames or twenty four frames a second in stereo is not nearly as compelling as ninety uh, or ninety six or one hundred and twenty. So there are things that are there, but I think that you're going to find that uh, when stereo works, it is stunning. You know, like and and it is something that you want to see all the time, and you feel like you're there. Um, and I admit, I grew up with a little, you know, the little thing with the, I don't you know, you push the view master, a little view master, which I loved. Um, and I uh, love the fact that it felt like it was just, I was right in front of it. Um, so, so I think that we're going to see a lot more of it than a lot less of it. Um, and, uh, and so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. It's just, I, I think that when we say, oh. when we look at something that's poorly implemented and say it's a gimmick, <laughs> then I think we have to wait until it's, I've, I've had the opportunity to implement it pretty well and it's. Pretty awesome, Fenwick. I may be I may be part of the problem there, Alex. Um, I don't think we actually established that. Uh, here's my thing. I, I'm okay with, and let's be clear: they're talking about stereo video, not 360 video, right? Yeah, yeah either one, but Ste sure. So I mean, there's we, are yeah. are they different? Uh, well, they're not different. You can have stereo 360 or mono 360, and you can have stereo 180 or mono 180, and you can even have rectilinear stereo. So when you watch a, when you watch Avatar, you're looking at rectilinear stereo, and then you, if you have the dual 180s that, that are on the R5C, then that's 180 stereo, and then you can have a spherical stereo. So we've done, and, we, and so spherical stereo is the hardest, and we've done a fair bit of that as well. Um, and that's what the Ozo, which is not right back there right now, is, can do, could do. Um, and so, so anyway, and it's super compelling. So would, would stereo also be called 3D? Yeah, people call it 3D. Okay. But, it's, so, but again, it's, it, it was done really, really well by James Cameron, and then it was ruined by all the other filmmakers who shouldn't be allowed <laughs> to make films anymore, or definitely shouldn't be allowed to make it. They should have a license for 3D films, in my opinion. <laughs> like, you know, like it's just, you know, because they ruin the whole industry. They ruin the entire, you know, it's worth going to see a James Cameron 3D film. It's, it's stunning. Uh, it is not worth seeing anybody else's films in 3D. I think the one complaint that I would have, and this is not about stereo, uh, uh, video, but 360 video is that although an interesting art form, I, I don't think I could call it filmmaking. Well, I, I think, it, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have to, like, I don't know, I don't know if you have to make it filmmaking. Like, I don't know. I think I wouldn't define it that way. Uh, right. It's an experience. But, but, but I think it's good to, to, to make that distinction. There's something about filmmaking, which is taking somebody on a specific journey and not just throwing them into an environment to try and experience something on their own. I think the beauty of uh, cinematography is that I get to show you 
the world the way I see the world and just putting you in a 360 bubble. And I, Jack, I understand your question was about stereo video. So I'm, I'm diverging a little bit here now. I'm, I'm almost done. But just throwing somebody in a 360 sphere and saying, go ahead, look, whatever you want. That's not well, really filmmaking. It's something, but I, it's, I can't call it filmmaking. It's just it's just a different medium, I'm, and I was I've been I've gotten kind of hooked on. They're using AI to fix old films, so the films that looked jaggedy and fast, and all these other things um, in the that were shot in the 18th, 19th century and the early twentieth century, um, they've now started. If you go up to YouTube and you do sixty frame per second, nineteen, you know, uh, old film or something like that, you'll see lots and lots and lots of these videos. And what they're doing is they're taking the technology that's similar to what Peter Jackson took for the World War I footage, um, When We Were Men, and they're applying it to all these things and, pu and putting those frames back in and, and normalizing the speed. And number one, fascinating, just fascinating to watch. You actually have this high resolution experience of what it was like to live. There was a, there's one where someone just shot a snowball fight. You know, like a snowball fight in, in Chicago in, you know, 110 years ago, you know, it's just, and, and, and just the normalcy and, and, and how much we just haven't changed that much. You know, like people are just people and they're just doing their thing. So I enjoy that part. But the other thing that I realized is that every medium starts with, hey, I'm going to just shoot something. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Like, so all of that film, like we have these cameras and you have these geeks and, these, and they just start going out there and just shooting things. And they're shooting people working in the garden and they're shooting people standing around and they're shooting people at a fair and they're shooting people at a train stop and they're shooting, you know, and they're just capturing stuff because they don't know what to do with it yet. And then over time, as they start to see it, you start to see, oh, I could do this or I could move this. When we started doing, when we had film cameras, we were shooting stage plays. You know, like we were like, we will have people do things in front of the camera and that'll be great. And then they were like, well, we could just cut between one, we go from one place to another and then we could do this. And before you knew it, you had bullet time, you know? And so the, so the thing is, is that right now we're at that, hey, we're shooting things. We don't know what to do with this yet, but we're experiencing it. And I think that there's going to be, and, and I don't know if you need to put it on for two and a half hours either. So I think that the other thing is, is that um, there's an opportunity for us to, the, the one that I, the example that I started shooting, I actually shot some test plates, which I've never really done anything with because it was it's hard. Um, but I, you know, I went to, I went to um, uh, Gettysburg and there's Pickett's Charge. And when you stand where the Pickett's Charge happened, you can see the ridge that, you know, that, that goes across it. You can see a little round top. You can see all those bits and pieces. And I just imagine being able to have it, you know, be able to put a headset on, you're standing there, put a headset on and experience two minutes of what it was like or five minutes of what it was like to be there, and, you know, and that 3D and everything else would be very, you know, very interesting to, to, to look at. And I think you can do that a lot. Does that need to be a whole movie? I don't know. I don't think, I don't know, you know, I, I don't think it needs to be. Um, so I think that there's, um, I think that you're going to see a lot of things like that where we can visualize the world. Um, I think that what Apple's probably doing with some of the rumors that we saw and some of the pictures that we've seen leak out is shoot certain scenes in a, on an Apple, you know, for their Apple TV content, not the whole show, but certain scenes in 180 so that you can experience, if you want to go and just, it's like a highlight reel or like the extras might be, I can put my, my headset on and go in and just see that scene happen and maybe even sometimes see the making of that scene but sometimes you might experience that scene in 180 and what you're going to see is Apple experimenting with it, you know, and they, and it's, it would be so convenient if they had control of uh, content production for some of the content. Oh, wait, they do. <laughs> so, so, and it would be really cool to see, uh, to be able to experience soccer, a soccer match from the, from the field, but they would have to get broadcast rights. Oh, they do. <laughs> so, so, so they, so I think we're going to see a lot of experimentation over the next couple of years with these headsets. Uh, Nigel, you have a quick comment? Yeah. Uh, that, reminded me of an experience we had in it. We were doing a civil war, and I don't remember which battlefield it was. I'm sorry, it just escaped my mind. I think it's somewhere in Mississippi. And what we were doing was driving from point to point and then using the phone to dial into somebody who told us what happened. The yeah. thought of rather than the phone giving us that, being able to put on the goggles and see it, would change that experience for so many people. There's a, there's a, there's an integrated experience there that just wants to happen that hasn't happened for I, when I've got my very first uh, GPS receiver. Um, I, I bought it in I think about 1999, and it was it wasn't on a <laughs> it wasn't on a phone. It was 1999. It was a big box that was this big with an antenna that you'd flip out, and you had to kind of put it on the dashboard because you put it anywhere else in the car that couldn't see the satellite. 
and you plug it into a laptop and the laptop would have, I think, I don't know, um, some GPS program that would tell you where you were. And as we looked at that, I was like, um, so immediately what I wanted was, I wanna take a tour of Route 66, or I wanna take a tour of Civil War battlefields. And I want, I know where you're at. And so what I wanna do is be able to have pre-programmed content with, and, and at, back then, it was more of a, um, uh, like you have to record all this stuff, but at this point you could probably use a controlled large langu language model to sit there and talk to you about the the, bat the the next battle you're going, let's say you're going Civil War battlefield, you're going to Antietam, from Antietam to to uh, the wilderness, to Fredericksburg, to, the, to, to Gettysburg. And as you're driving, it has sounds and things and interviews and talk, it like it grabs all this data to kind of give you a feel of what was happening and why this next, this next thing was important. And then you get there and it says, okay, get out. And I, and, and I imagined it back then as you just look out and it tells you, if you look to your right, you're gonna see this. If you look to your left, you're gonna see this. And, and so they had that experience, but now you could have it do all of that and then have it say, get out and put your headset on and you're gonna see this, you know, and it activates it based on where you're at. And that kind of, uh, that kind of touring experience, there's so many historical locations and, and things that you could, that kind of touring experience, I think would be very compelling for a lot of people um, to do it, even without the headset, just being able to have a GPS driven uh, tour that was uh, accurate. And when you think about all the little trackers that we're using, those low, those, um, those, ultra wideband trackers can identify with a with a matched um, hashed scan those things can your we can tell where your phone is to the millimeter right and where it's pointed and with that you could theoretically have heads up displays so imagine going to um, you know some ancient uh, ruin and have it show you what it used to look like right over top of what's there on your phone or in your headset. Um, but you could just go like this and you could see people walking around from the history and everything else. And it would change it. It's, it's, I personally think it's a billion dollar opportunity, but I don't have time to get to it. <laughs> Mitch Hill? Yeah, the uh, thing you're talking about, Alex, uh, there is a device that does that, puts it all together, uh, made by a company called Alcorn McBride. And it's a GPS activated uh, audio playback. And we messed with that with uh, with a, a local museum so that if you look to your left, you know, and at the right point, because they were trying to have the driver uh, time his driving to the soundtrack instead of it being the other way around. So um, that worked really well. I'd love to see it go to the next level. It just to the I, hope the, I hope the driver doesn't wear a uh, headset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a bit of a iffy. And Nigel, last time. Yes. Okay, so if you go to national parks and you drive around national parks in the U.S., you should look for gypsy guides. You have to buy the gypsy guide for each national park. If you do Arches uh, and Bryce, I think it's a combined one. They're about $10. And they do in audio in your car exactly what you described, Alex. And they are go. really the best way to see a national park. And they'll say, stop here. There are two walks. There's a long walk. There's a short walk. Here's oh, what wow. if you do it. Love gypsy guides. Excellent. Didn't know this was going to be as long a discussion, but I thought it fascinating. I wanted to leave it going. I this is what happens to the producers. If, if we think we have, hey, we've got a lot of room. There's not as many questions as we, you know, the, 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 for the second hour. We'll just, we'll just take, take one question that we're interested in and just run along. I love that. I thought it was yeah, yeah, a fascinating good. discussion. I should have right before that said, though, if you have questions, please put them into the show. Use the Makana system. And as always, please vote those questions up or down so we know what you are most interested in as the audience. That is what programs our show every single day so don't uh, don't neglect to pay attention to that thank you everyone and all let's go to the next question next up is Helken Forrest from Stockholm Sweden asking do you know of any software that can control Sony lack devices such as video cameras uh, Alex yeah, you know, I just had the hold on let me see if I can find my history I was while we were um, in another uh, uh, oh no um, the uh, control, it, I, I don't know what the answer is to this, but there is a controlyourcamera.blogspot.com. Um, this is an old uh, post, so you might have to kind of look through it. But what, what they're talking about is using OS X terminal to control Arduino, to control, you know, and, and so, and what they really get into there is what you need to know, what you have to send as length commands. So what is the binary? Because that's what you, you're sending out little electrical codes. And so, I think that the the answer to this is probably having a micro bit or a Arduino 
excuse me, Arduino or other things, um, being able to send that 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 very precise thing out to it and then being able to build a control for it. I don't know if a lot of people do it. I, I haven't used Lank in a long time. But but the um, but I think that that's it's they have what's nice there is they have the first thing that you're going to need which is the the electrical uh, requirement so now you tie something else into it and you could use a variety of software Isadora or other or other things to send out the commands that are required to make that actually happen. The very first thing I ever edited on was a Sony device called an Evo ninety seven hundred. It was a little too well eight millimeter videotape editor. And I remember that there was a technical manual available for it that had a, quite a extensive system on LAN C and how it worked like, I used to call it that, I don't know why. Um, so it, you may be able to find some of the old manuals for the either prosumer or just under professional level gear. And Sony was pretty good about having those technical manuals and they specified a lot of this stuff. So that might be another source of some of the controls for you. Let's go to the next question. Paul Wallace from Austin, Texas is asking, Melee, it's a PC that runs hot, but Fun Cooler 3 Pro could drop that temp to 86 degrees and has a cool RGB lighting and a phone app. Would it fit and cool like the Melee? Ooh, it has lighting in it? Cool, Mitchell. <laughs> yes, I've looked it over, and uh, from what I can tell looking at it, uh, sorry, Paul, it was just an unusual looking device. Uh, it looks like it might make the Melee look cool, but not actually cool it <laughs> there is a difference there I, it's interesting some of the uh gaming group is very into the aesthetics of blue lights and things like that i find that really fascinating hopefully uh if you go in this direction paul it turns out to be useful but it appears you get no guarantees here let's go to the next question from douglas carmichael yolo live has introduced network bonding for their yolo box pro devices you think network management functions are best left to dedicated network devices, not audio video devices? What are your thoughts? Alex, what say you? I actually think it's easier with the audio video devices. Um, so when they build them, they build them for what they need. Um, the, the bonded network devices, um, you know, oftentimes don't perform as well as the video devices that have the built in because they're tuning it for what they need. And the bonded video, um, the generalized systems um, tend not to be tuned as well. Next question. From Chris Fenwick in Emeryville, California, and right here on our panel, I'm going to do this best I can, Chris. Help! The smartest friends I know, I, I can't for the life of me figure out how to adjust the tilt of maps on the iPhone. Mac OS, no problem. iOS, big problem. Help! And who has raised their hand but Chris himself? Chris? So, ironically, I literally just got it to work. Like, like <laughs> just, like, oh, my question's coming up. Let me go double check. So here's the trick. You have to be zoomed all the way in on the map. You then have to turn on the 3D button, which is in the upper right-hand corner. You then have to press and pause a little bit with two fingers and then drag up and down. And you can literally, like I know I don't have one of your fancy Sony cameras, but I'm looking all the way down a street in San Francisco here. Uh, so you can adjust it. It's two fingers and then you can, uh, see now it's not working. It's persnickety. Anyway, you have to be all the way zoomed in two fingers, drag up and down, and you can adjust the tilt. Once you've adjusted the tilt, you can zoom out, but you can't readjust the tilt. Anyway, sorry. Interesting. This is a, a waste of good web. No, no, no. There may be somebody out there who has exactly the same frustration you do. And I think that's I'm part of what makes not. office hours as cool as it is, is that, you know, we, this may not be a pro, pro for everybody, but there's somebody out there that this has been a nagging little problem for, and you've solved it for him. So good I job. I apologize, Alex. I owe you two minutes of web time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Let's move to the next question. And it's from John Fisher in Oklahoma City. Is there a better way to shock mount a Shure MV7 than the linked mount? Mike is on an Elgato LP arm and rises up to the speaker. There's a whole bunch of shock mounting possibilities out there. The MV7 will probably have something from Shure itself, but probably one of the third-party things will work as well. Alex, what's your experience? That's the one we use. <laughs> so, so, so that's what we use for it. It's a little tricky because the it's not a, you're not clamping on to the to the mic. The mic already has a mount, so you're you need something that's attaching to it. Um, and so I believe that is the one that we're using. I looked at my Amazon account and saw it there, so I'm pretty sure that's what what I bought and what we're using. 
Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Chris has some alternative uh, up no, there. That's, or? A, that's what he. That's, that's the one, the one? He showed. Yeah. Ah, interesting. You have to screw Look something into it. You can't. You know, you're not clamping onto it. So that's the that's the challenge. That's an interesting array. So the bands, even my Neumanns use those kind of things. In fact, I have it over here because I was using it yesterday. Neumann, and it's upside down at the moment, has a whole series of little bouncy bands. And so in the right conditions, if you have everything adjusted correctly, that really does a fabulous job of isolating a microphone from mechanical noise. Let's move to the next question. From Alton Christensen in New York, New York, looking for an app to record a ProRes feed from an Insta360 link all on board an M1 Mac Mini. Softron, not an option. No NDI from link. Currently using Mimo Live, other options. Uh, Alex, do you have some thoughts as to what might work for him? I was going to su suggest Mimo Live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so that was, that's the one that we would probably, uh, that, that, that we would use um, for that. Um, the... Yeah, it's it's the ProRes part that is that is a little bit more complicated as far as what you would how you would record that because um, there's just not a lot of things because otherwise you could use QuickTime. I think QuickTime will record. I don't. I think you may want to look at QuickTime's uncompressed. I think that there is a version of QuickTime that it will let you do highest quality or whatever, and it will do some version of ProRes. So um, I would take a look at at, at just QuickTime itself, um, but I don't know of another. Uh, ProRes recording solution. Well, Apple did have QuickTime Pro. I, I have it installed on everything, but I never use that function of it, so I can't speak of it. There's a record. I mean, there's Make Movie, yeah. and when you open it up, if you have something coming in, if it can see the camera, the question is, but if it sees the camera, you can record with QuickTime, but the question is, I don't remember what the res. I don't remember what the uh, um, quality. I, I know that there's one that's H.264, but I believe that there's a way to set that to, you know, highest quality and you end up with a version of ProRes. I don't know what, I can't remember what version of ProRes you get though. Hopefully that gave you some pathways to go down, Alton. Let's move to the next question. From Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking YouTube is testing AI generated summaries in stream. Is YouTube doing enough with AI? John Preto, help us. Yes, YouTube has been training one of their future upcoming LLMs with every video on YouTube, which will be spectacular. Whoa, that's a pretty large task. Of course, that's the point of large computing data sets. Uh, that looks that sounds like it's going to be interesting. Next question. From Jack Rupel and Rupel in uh, Breckenridge, Colorado. How might hybrid events uh, methods be used in a TED Talk? Alex. Well, I, I think that the for a TED Talk it, itself, um, I think that I think it'd be hard to do. I mean, the hybrid, the first hybrid is just to let people watch it, you know, and, and they're already doing that um, to some degree. But figuring out how you might bring some people in um, from somewhere else. Now, TED really focuses very much on getting the speakers into the room. So that could be a little harder. But I think that there could be a way of taking people places, um, you know, from TED. I don't think they've done very much of that. There's other things that are like TED that are probably not as public as TED. And they're pretty pretty quiet. Um, and they definitely do that. I've done that for them. <laughs> so bringing people in from all over the world, sometimes near orbit, sometimes underwater. Um, so one of the things that you can do in hybrid is is to take people on a, on a, on a little bit of a... Of a um, exploration. So you could take, while you're talking to someone, they can take you to Africa or to Cambodia or to underwater or to something else. I haven't really seen Ted do very much of that. Um, so I think that, that that could be a really interesting way to do it. Of course, being able to ask questions. Ted is not very question heavy. Um, they give you 18 minutes and then they typically have uh, five to 10 minutes of, of Q&A um, to build out essentially usually build out um, 30 minute blocks. So that's, or at least that's that was my experience when I was there. So, so I think that that's, um, so I don't know how well it would work. I, I, you know, I think that, I think Ted's great. I'm, it's really built to have all that conversation happen between the sessions because they have huge gaps between the sessions that they have there so that people can mix. Um, but I would love to have a version of Ted that was more conversational like ours, our show. Like, so <laughs> what they're talking about, but with our format. And don't forget, um, our second hour today, Ted Pizarski is going to be here for Live View. So if you have questions for that second hour guest, put them in. And also, if you have questions for the first hour, we might still be able to get a couple more in. So that's the future. The present is next question. Douglas Carmichael asking, would there be any benefit to using a stereo line isolator like this Walrus Audio Canvas 
on an unbalanced synth in the studio instead of a DI box. And Mitch Hill. Uh, well, first of all, you didn't say if you had a problem. So I guess if you're talking about uh, cost benefits, uh, it probably doesn't benefit you at all to use anything uh, unless you get a hum or some kind of other uh, nastiness going on there. Um, a DI box or that device that you've uh, indicated, the Walrus Audio, uh, basically just uh, isolates the uh, synth from whatever it's going to, like a mixer or whatever device you have. So there are a number of ways to do that with a DI box. It's active as active circuitry to accomplish that. Uh, radial makes a lot of them. Um, and I prefer the passive devices that use a high-quality transformer. Uh, again, if you don't have a problem, don't fix it. Uh, Chris Fenwick. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm going to go off the, the rails here. Um, the, the question that we just had about recording, uh, it was from Alton Christensen in New York. Alton, if you open up QuickTime, uh, the QuickTime player, bit of a misnomer. You go to record movie or add new, add a new movie recording. There is a, um, a check box. There is a, a little user interface pops up and next to the record button is a little tiny down arrow. If you click on that, you can choose which camera source you want to record from. You can re record, uh, choose which audio source you can record from. And if you scroll all the, all the way down, there are two settings. One is high, and the next one is maximum. And if you set it to maximum, it will record ProRes 4222 or 422. Yeah. There you go. Problem solved. Chris, you're still coming in pretty low, negative 30 or so, just so you know. Um, because I'm not angry enough. Oh, there you go. Let's make Chris angry for the last 15 minutes of the show. Next question. From Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks, China versus USA, who wins? Uh, they've... Excuse me. The China has proposed a 40-minute internet time limit for children, and access from a mobile device would be prohibited between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, okay, I'm a little confused here, but that's okay. Let's go to uh, who raised their hands on this one. It looks like Nigel. Did you want to address this? I didn't. I was going to answer the question or at least delay the question that you were going to ask about China versus the U.S. I thought that was more of a Sunday question, so I've now made messed that up. Um, I have no children, and I feel it is inappropriate for me to advise others who have about what Internet time they should leave. You're, you're maybe the third person on the internet who feels that way. Everybody else <laughs> thinks it's their god right to weigh in on everything. So I'm a little confused here, but we're just going to go to the magic words. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, can you use the Dolby Atmos tools to bring Atmos delivery to a DAW that doesn't natively support it? I'm not sure if that's possible. I mean, you know, that's the, the two stages of a workflow, and I don't know how much. It's going to depend in part on the DAW, whether the digital audio workstation can link and and or have some sort of connection. From what Alex said the other day when he was talking about that, and he's preparing for the, our guest to come in in a little bit, um, there is a the only thing that really does all the Dolby Atmos tools is the Dolby Atmos application. So if I understood that correctly from a few days ago when he was discussing this, uh, it may be a hard no, Douglas, uh, but I don't guarantee that I'm right about that. Uh, do some checking yourself. Uh, by the way, we're just down to the last couple of questions. So if you have a couple of more to throw in here, it's going to be helpful. We have to get through another 10 minutes or so. So uh, let's go to the next question. All right, Nigel, here comes your question again. Paul Wallace from Austin, Texas, asks China versus USA. Who wins the AI race? Mark Andreessen said on Lex Friedman that we need to pay more attention to this. Nigel, how, what's your feeling? I'd like to refer the right honorable gentleman to the answer I gave earlier, which used to be <laughs> how the prime minister avoided. And prime minister's question time in the UK was always an amazing thing when it was only 15 minutes because there were like only four or five questions you could ask. And they were like, what was the prime minister doing today? So they always asked that. And then the follow-up question was the really important one. What I tried to say, sidebar, apologies, uh, is I think that sounds like a Sunday question for us, which is a little more philosophical. 
Yeah, it may be a rumination question. We do have some time to fill here, though, today before we get to the top of the hour. So maybe a little dancing around it. It's interesting to think about whether these two vastly different political systems, what what's going to end up being the most efficient? Because this whole AI world is really changing everything. And so is a top-down authoritarian culture like they have predominantly in China the more efficient way to drive the country into the future? Or is our open kind of quasi-capitalist, everybody takes a shot at it? Alec, uh, I'm sorry, Nigel, you raised yeah, your hand. I, was, so you, yeah. I still think this is a great Sunday conversation, but I, I, I do want to ask a slightly tangential thought, which is Go for how it. is, if you were to describe what a really great experience look like and sound like to collect people to watch podcasts. I think Lex Friedman would fail on almost every example. Um, it doesn't look great. It doesn't sound great. Yet he has an amazing following and he um, seems to really get all the world's best guests. So I, you know, I often watch it, although they're very long and wonder what, you know, how important there comes a point, I guess, when the value of the content exceeds the value of the look and feel. And I think that's an interesting question for us who do uh, these sorts of projects is, is when does that switch point over? And I'm trying not to have the political conversation about China. But no, no, no and that's perfectly fair. Perfectly fair. And I, I've experienced the same thing. I've, I've experienced sitting and listening to someone who is a horrible presenter, but something about the presentation of content is so compelling that I can't take my eyes off of them. I've described before having a, a, a guy that I, I wasn't videotaping that day, I was just in the audience, but was drawing circuitry in the air with magical things and connecting pieces of stuff together. And I looked around, I just happened to glance over the side and most of the people in the audience were like, they, he just completely lost his audience. Now, I found it compelling, partially because of what he was trying to describe for me, but partially just because of the performance that he was comfortable giving and the fact that this guy was bright enough to track a very complex system in midair and could visualize it. And I just knew that when he went to the port on the fifth box from the left, that it was exactly the thing he had told me the port on the fifth box on the left was for, even though none of us could see it and it didn't exist. He just had an, a, a blank stage up there. I, some of those people are really compelling in terms of how they can present something that people can't see. Uh, I, John, I saw you nodding a lot through the course of this, and I know that you're a fan of these podcasts. Do you have any thoughts additionally on it? I, I have lots of thoughts about this. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I have to fight with Paul because I don't like answering Paul's silly questions. Ah, okay. Fair enough. Well, everybody gets to make those own choices for themselves. We do have a few more questions to dive into here. Hopefully we can ax, uh, wax eloquently or semi-eloquently about them as we move through, but let's get to the next one. All right, ready to wax on and wax off. Uh, Peter Moore from Auckland, New Zealand, asking TVOS 17 beta has new spatial stuff in it. Spherical angle functions, spherical linear interpola interpolation, interpolation, Swing twist decomposition for spatial rotations. Thoughts? Well, that wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that Apple is very hot on Vision Pro and is really interested in the spatial uh, layout of virtual objects. I mean, you know, they've obviously been working on in, in this environment for a long time. My guess is that it's been more than a decade in development quietly and, and hats off to Apple for their culture of secrecy because nobody really saw what was coming before they announced it. In uh, There were tons of rumors, but nobody had much specifics about it. Now that we know what Vision Pro looks like, it does have the potential, I think, to change the way people think about some things. And there's going to be some early adopter kind of things that I think are going to be pretty compelling. Um, I, I, I said in the early days of 3D that things like remote surgery and things like that would be amazing if they can get this refined down to the point where uh, a world-class surgeon could telecommute into a world-class robotic operating suite and be able to effectively do, you know, 
that kind of scale surgery. Uh, it, it just changes how talent gets distributed around the world, and that could be very powerful for all of society. Uh, all the manufacturing stuff where you're building realistic products, uh, you know, quality control is going to become a different thing if an engineer can go in there and examine not just the products rolling off the assembly line, but the tools used to make them, uh, help with adjustments and things like that. I mean, there's just a ton of things that it just that three dimensional spatial operations can make easier, more efficient, and drive savings into. So I think in in those kind of areas. Even if it doesn't become the entertainment strap on your headset thing in everybody's living room that people talk about, there's going to be a serious place in society for the technology that's being developed underneath this. That's at least how I've, how I've come to feel about the whole Vision Pro thing. Might be wrong. Well, only time will tell. Uh, but it certainly has developed a lot of um, buzz and you know, they're not in people's hands yet. That's one of the things that I'm pretty strong on. You know, everybody has opinions, and I have my own opinions about them. We haven't actually tried it. When you get it on yourself and decide whether it makes sense for the kind of person you are and the kind of things that you have to do, that's when, for me, the rubber meets the road. Might end up, you put it on, and you go, not nah, too heavy, don't want to mess with it, nothing I'm interested in, and you walk away from it. Somebody else might go, oh, my gosh, this is my future, and I want to play. So, all that said, next question. Gordon Lake, Los Angeles, California, wants to know, when using a 50-inch monitor for a switcher, is there a real difference between OLED and QLED monitors? Just looking at multi-view and program. Mitchell, start us off here. I have a, uh, a, a OLED, and it's beautiful, but it's not bright enough in, in that kind of an environment. Uh, the QLEDs are brighter, and, you know, sure, the blacks are close, but not... OLED uh, blacks. I would I would try a third uh, option, and that would be look for the new micro LEDs. I think they're going to be bright and have great blacks. So uh, that would be the next step in the evolution of 50 inch screens. Nigel, uh, I don't know. I can answer the technical question of the difference, but I do and did own I did own an OLED screen, and I found it suffered from burn in. And so, if you're physically going to have the same thing up there all the time like, uh, you know, multi-view with, like, dividing lines, you might find that burns into the screen. Yeah, I've heard the same thing about OLED. It, it, it can pretty quickly get persistence of imagery. Let's go to the next question. Um, I just wanted to say quickly before oh, that, sure. it, depending on the, the manufacturer, they do put an orbit function in it to keep that burning happening, and my Sony's have been fine, just to let you know. Okay. Moving on next to Hacken Forests in Stockholm, Sweden, do you know of any solution that stitches multiple live video feeds to a panorama with low latency? Um, I do not know of stitching software. Alex is pretty good at this, and Alex has spent some serious time uh, working on panoramas and stitching things together. So uh, it, this may be one of those things that we'll just send it back and, and come back another day, and we'll be able to take a better swing at it. Uh, let's go to the next question, I think our last one, before we make our transition. Yep, last one for the hour. Tommy Shands from St. Paul, Minnesota, asking, what are a couple of go-to podcasts that you techie folks like? Now, a lot of the people on our panel today have talked at length about the podcast that they go to. I'm not a big podcast consumer, I think, because I spend most of my time creating content rather than consuming it. But I have heard people here on the show talk about their uh, faves, and uh, I'm surprised that nobody's raised their hand for them. Does anybody in the panel have any podcast that, they, that they're specific about wanting to go, particularly tech podcasts, uh, that help you understand the world of technology around us? No? All right. Well, then that's where we're left. We are very close to the top of the hour, and it's time for me to uh, let you know a couple of things before we make the transition here at the top of the hour. Uh, first and foremost, tomorrow, Friday's show, uh, it's our back to school special. As many uh, of you know, we've been specializing in education for the course of the last two weeks or three weeks, um, and it's been a fabulous circumstance. That and the, the disability, uh, uh, let me go back and reset here. 
we've been doing disabilities, and it's been a fabulous discussion on how uh, that community can best interact with some of the tools that we do. That was the break from our normal education Saturdays, and we're about to head back into doing education every Saturday. And so with everyone going back to school, tomorrow's discussion is going to be about some of the best hardware and software suggestions we have for those of you who want to do uh, education sorts of things. Also, on Saturday's show, uh, that's what's been happening. We are going to be doing a two-hour marathon session devoted to question and answer for most of your pressing production-related questions as we move towards uh, getting set up for the after-school sessions. Uh, so that's kind of the, a look forward at what's happening with the show. Everything else uh, will go as normal. And don't forget, if you want an idea of what's happening on Office Hours, make sure you head to the web website at officehours.global. You'll find a lot of connections to what's going on where. That ends my part of this, and I'm going to toss it over to Alex for our guest. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm happy to uh, in, uh, to welcome uh, Dan Pizarski. Uh, Dan is the CTO of LiveView, and before that was the VP of Engineering for LiveView. Um, and uh, we're very excited to have him on. We've been I've been using live view products for over a decade uh, on hundreds of shows. And we've been using the 800 uh, to experiment with HDR 5.1 uh, streaming from a cellular device. <laughs> so, um, which has been uh, has been really a, a great experience for us so far. And so we're really excited to have uh, to have Dan on to tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Really excited to be here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the the live view origin story? Like how did how did we get here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the legend goes that uh, the founder, one of the founders was going to a uh, football match in Israel and happened to walk past a satellite truck that was doing the production at that time and saw the giant truck and the big satellite dish and the huge cables running into the stadium and thought to himself, God, there's got to be a, a better way to do this, especially now with everybody having a, this is 16 plus years ago, but even then having a pretty powerful cellular device in their pocket and thought, couldn't we transmit video over cellular? And Livey was born early days, uh, you know, of um, kind of skunk works working on trying to get video transmission to work over cellular and realizing early on that they would have to use multiple connections at the same time. This is in the era really of, of 3G, early 3G uh, times, have to use multiple connections at the same time to get the kind of bandwidth they were looking for. And that's where the idea of bonding came from. And really has become our core intellectual property and and uh you know part of the trade is, is where the origin of what's called now cellular bonding used widely for uh, news gathering also for sports production entertainment production but the idea to take multiple connections ip connections at the same time use them at, um, together to get better resiliency better bandwidth can you tell can you tell us a little bit about what the trick is to making that work? Like, how does that how how does the bonding actually? I mean, what you can tell us, but how does the bonding actually work? Because I will say that I've used a lot of different cellular devices, and the LiveView ones are the most stable. Is what can, for what you can say? What are you doing differently? Do you think that makes a difference? Yeah, absolutely. So we we're very proud of our protocol. What we call LiveView Reliable Transporter (LRT). We've worked on it for again sixteen plus years. Uh, about the age of the company. We have some white papers on it. If anybody's like really interested in the deep dive uh, on the website, I'll give the kind of brief overview. I mean, it's it's doing bonding along with other forms of resiliency. So it's using A or Q like verification. The packets have arrived, informing the encoder of how well each connection is doing, packet loss, round trip time and latency. The uh, encoder is then making decisions about this part of the this connection shouldn't be part of the bond group for a while because its health isn't high enough but I'll keep testing it with more data, not important data to see when it recovers because conditions change. You might be on the move and RF conditions change or things might be moving around you and RF conditions change. So it's constantly testing to see if a connection comes back, puts it back in the bond group. All of it uses a dynamic form of forward error correction. And for people that are familiar with that technique where extra mathematical data is included in the stream and packets can be recovered from that data. We use a dynamic amount of forward error correction based on the network conditions. And then there's a few parts of it that are a little bit more secret sauce that are geared specifically towards the behavior of cellular networks. So a cellular network as an IP network behaves quite differently from a LAN network in terms of rapidly changing latency round trip time. Uh, some of the things about 
the way uh, buffering works that you might fill the buffer with a lot of data and that data might never be delivered uh, if the connection severs before the buffer is uh, actually flushed. So some behavior like that that we take into account specifically, all of it adds together into LRT, which sends this uh, reliable video and audio over cellular. I know that for me, the first thing, first thing that I saw, I'm I'm on the Twit network with uh, with MacBreak and Leo Laporte was one of the very first users of, or very early users of of the Live View, and there was a point at South by Southwest, I think, where Leo was had a Live View on his backpack and he was crowd surfing <laughs> with, the, with the Live View on, and that was the thing that opened up my eyes, like, oh, this is something that I have to understand more about. But nice. from those early days of 2007 or eight or whatever. Uh, what has changed in the technology related to cell service? Like, has that really, um, has that made it a lot easier, harder, different for you to um, to manage that connection? Yeah, so, you know, obviously where the public networks have gone is from 3G to 4G to LTE to now to 5G. And we could spend a couple hours even just talking about those technology changes and and what 5G has really meant you know, how much we've achieved what 5G promised or not. And of course, we had a lot of the same things when LTE <laughs> we're, not, we're not a very, we're not a very positive group around 5G. <laughs> you know, because it, it, it just, it's just not available in a lot of places. Not available in a lot of places. And where it is available, it's on frequencies that don't have a lot of bandwidth compared to the original promises of like this huge bandwidth you're going to get from it. But it, but it does have some components. For example, the in-air protocol itself is different. And that does have more deterministic latency than the LTE in-air protocol. Uh, so we see some advantages to it, but it hasn't. Yeah, we. I'd like I said, we can have a whole conversation on how much it's lived <laughs> up to the promise or not. But anyway, the the cell networks have gone through this evolution. That's been great for us. They get more and more reliable. Coverage gets wider. Latency gets much lower. That's a huge, you know, part of uh, the equation for us. Latency gets more deterministic. It's another huge part of the the equation for us. That's you know sometimes more of a nuance that that the average consumer doesn't get. But in the same token expectations have gone up and up so from hey we can we're a news organization we can accept you know 320 by 240 kind of video if it's a breaking news situation up to hey we're uh, covering sports here we need to do 4k flawlessly all the time right at, at pretty low latency so in that classic moore's law sense as things have gotten better on the network so have users found ways to consume all the bandwidth we can give so even as we say Oh yeah, now a single, you know, decent five sub six five G connection can maybe give us twenty megabits of uh, reliable uplink. We, we easily eat that up with not just the primary audio and video, but additional comms, video backhaul, PTZ camera control, all of the extra things that now users uh, sort of expect to be able to do over uh, remote production. Now you're pretty wide. I, I have to admit, I'm mostly f familiar with the 600s and the 800s. I have very little familiarity with some some of the other other products that you're putting out. But it's everything from a cell phone, right? I mean, it's it, it's all the way from your there's an app on your phone um, and all the way up to the the 800s. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we we have a app for the cell phone, and it'll actually bond the two radios in the cell phone. So the Wi-Fi and the LTE or 5G radio in the cell phone still use bonding in that uh, context. We have a whole line of products that's aimed at more the prosumer users. So if you're doing all online workflows or going straight to a platform like YouTube or Twitch uh, and you don't need to come out in a actual studio or come out in an MCR kind of configuration like our broadcast customers do, then, you know, the Live View Solo line might be appropriate for you. It's got a, a very different feature set and, um, you know, a little more geared towards, again, just that kind of uh, online creator type streamer. Um, but, you know, offered for that market so that there's a product appropriate for those users. They don't have to necessarily get involved in the uh, broadcast products, which obviously come with a little bit different price tag and, and a lot more complexity. And now the, the newest product out there is the um, is the Live View Studio. And that was acquired. You, you acquired another company to kind of bring that in-house. That's right. So we got interested in, you know, we I, story we've been telling here is that we were very focused on contribution and we got interested in, can we get more involved in the rest of the video value chain, video production chain, and started to look at production as an interesting part of that, looking at, you know, here, here we are in the year 2020 plus, so we started looking at cloud native production uh, and the, what that enables for users and got very interested in cloud native production. And then uh, after taking a survey of that kind of market, got to know this company in France called EasyLive.io, 
uh, and liked the um, products that they had built, both from how feature rich it was and had the the cloud native components of it. So like just last year, closed the acquisition of them and just this past NEB relaunched it as Live View Studio. Now, have you made any major changes to it um, from the previous product? We did. So uh, the the big features that we've launched so far, and of course, we've got a long roadmap after this of still things we hope to improve is that protocol we were just discussing, LRT, as native input and output to Studio. So of course, before you could use RTMP, SRT, uh, they even supported some formats like WIP uh, for the users that are familiar with that. But we wanted to take our protocol and have it be able to natively go in so you didn't have to hop through a LRT to RTMP step uh, and then natively go out too so that you can take the program output from Studio and use it in the rest of your live view workflow because you might want to take that back to a physical receiver because you need SDI out or you might want to flow that into our live view matrix product which is a distribution middle mile distribution product uh, so we saw you know value on both sides of it now that's launched it takes LRT in and out natively it's the only cloud uh, production platform that that does but of course we've got a long list of uh, other improvements coming now can it still take the other formats in as well so it does LRT oh, yeah. but so you can still send SRT and so you could theoretically mix and match here you could have a couple live views that are going into it but you could also have something coming from aws or something coming from another encoder uh something coming from an epifan you could all of those things could be flowing into this in the cloud is that does that yeah about right? absolutely and i would say even i mean speaking frankly the majority of our users right now are probably still using mostly those other encoders that lrt capabilities is fairly new uh and so when we think of the customers that you know, we inherited when we acquired the company, they're probably still largely using a, a long list of other encoders to get to the platform. And then the output to, um, so if I want to push it back out, I can send it out to like an LU4000. So if I want to push the output from the studio, my SDI delivery can be one of the boxes that you would normally have a live view connect to. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, Easy Live and, and now Live View Studio always had a long list of great output options. It was one of the things we really liked when we were, you know, getting to know the platform. You can go out to any of the online platforms and any of the protocols we just discussed. You can even output at different resolutions. So output nine by sixteen to something like TikTok, but in the you know same uh, production output sixteen by nine to to somewhere else. So that that all still remains. But what we added was right. You can come out to an LU four thousand or LU two thousand. Get that out as SDI if you want, um, and use that in your SDI workflow. Now, now, one of the things we've been we've been playing with with the eight hundred is multi channel. So we've been doing typically six channels or eight, eight channels out. Is that something we can do with this studio right now? Full transparency, no. It's it's each input is stereo right now. But like I was kind of mentioning, like we had a, this you know idea in our head of like, oh, here's all the features we'll want to add to it at post acquisition, and that's what we're working on right now. So multi channel audio. Definitely falls on that list. And is is uh, high dynamic range something that's also on that list to support? High dynamic range also on the list, and and again, full transparency doesn't doesn't support full four K mixing yet. So four K right. high dynamic range multi channel audio definitely on the list. And I think you have it here to show us, right? You have it. Have a, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Let's, let's take a look. So this is uh, this is the Live View Studio interface. Um, I happen to just not be in test mode right now, and uh, these and actually this is are, just and this is just a web browser, right? You're not there's just no a web app. browser, yeah. so it's a true online. Yeah, good point for for anybody that when I say cloud native, uh, that's not real familiar with that. This is entirely processed in the cloud. The user interface is HTML5. You can use it from anywhere in the world. You can have multiple operators from anywhere in the world. So if you want one person you know, running vision mixing and one person running graphics that you can definitely do that. Um, you can close the browser and everything stays running. The engine's still working. It's not actually executing in your, your browser client. You're just seeing the interface. It's actually executing in the cloud. Um, and then, you know, and, log and back the, in and see it again. What's the latency of the video that we're looking at here from the cloud? So, you know, how long does it take to, you know, if I'm cutting things, uh, how far behind am I? Uh, so this is WebRTC uh, video that's delivered directly from the Vision Mix engine to your browser. It's extremely low latency. So right. uh, you're looking at like sub 100 milliseconds to to see the change there. Right. Um, yeah. And they, these happen to just be fallback animations, actually. So one of the things that the uh, system allows is if your video uh, input would accidentally go away, camera and uh, battery on the camera goes dead or something like that. Uh, you can fall back to either a slate or 
a kind of a fallback video like as I'm using here uh, and then give you time to correct the error. What I wanted to, you know, just emphasize here is now here in, on my input, which is down here on this line, uh, I get this new box for LRT and that's where I can control uh, a live view unit directly from here, start my LU800 to be streaming to that. And when that gets fired up through the channel, we'll see that signal here. So now that's a true, you know, video input to an LU800 somewhere else in the world, uh, streaming LRT directly into the Division Mix platform. And then these, what we're looking at below are the layers. So these are graphics layers? Yeah. So you can have a, a video input layer. You can definitely have a graphics layer here. This happens to be plugged into singular.live right now um, using one of and their... So that, so that graphics layer is HTML5? HTML5. And... and the studio uh, interface itself has graphics capabilities. So if you need to do lower thirds or a logo, you know, bug, those are definitely capable. If you need more, again, full transparency, they're, they're relatively basic graphics, get a basic job done. If you need more sophisticated graphics than any of the HTML5 platforms that uh, I'm sure your viewers are very familiar with out there, we singular use... and, and tag board and display, um, right. You can just plug in that was HTML5 graphics here and also use a third-party graphics engine to do more sophisticated, data-driven, sports-oriented yep. kind of graphics. If yeah, we use, a, we use one called SPX here, um, you know, for all oh, the nice. graphics that, that we're doing here is all, all coming out of that engine. Um, so that would just be a matter. And how do you load? It's just, it just op you open up a browser page inside of the, inside of the app? Yes. So it, like in the case of Singular, I could open up a separate browser tab and have their control panel uh, to run through that trigger graphics, change lower thirds, things like that. That's great. Um, and uh, it, so, so you, basically that just gives you the link to all the graphics that you may want to put over top of it. And, um, and there's right. basically how many different uh, inputs can you, can you support? So it, the current state of the it, are on this right now is eight inputs. And then uh, this actually right in uh, IBC next month, we'll be announcing 12 inputs and expansion of 12 inputs. And when you say 12, say I have an 800 and I put four 1080p's into that 800. So that'll be four of those input. They, they just show up as individual inputs. That's right. Yep. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and the, the questions are starting to stack up a little bit. So let's go ahead and jump into the first question. Sure. All right. First question coming to us from Douglas Carmichael. I've heard of a one-man band streamer and streaming teams like Awkward's Travel on Twitch using LiveView products. How do they backhaul the video from LiveView unit to Twitch in absence of a backend server on their end? I really appreciate the mention of Awkward's Travels. They've been long with friends of, uh, of ours, and they uh, stream from a um, sailboat in the Mediterranean uh, for their Twitch <laughs> show. Uh, uh, sail around the Mediterranean uh using live view gear so they use all cloud uh as the option since they're not coming back to a, a physical plant right um in that case they're using a cloud receiver uh that can receive the lrt stream that can then output srt or rtmp that of course can be pure cloud you don't need any physical infrastructure for that um for a lot just a quick side note for a lot of those twitch like streamers they still want to pass through the obs software i'm sure everybody here is very familiar with because it's a key way to inject very Twitch-like graphics elements into it. Uh, and there's a number of third-party companies out there that will host OBS in the cloud for you. So you can also do that pure cloud. You don't need to be you know, held down by a, a physical infrastructure. So we, yes, we've got a lot of users that use a pure cloud workflow. Um, doesn't necessarily look like uh, this type of studio workflow where you're doing true multi-camera mixing. It's more about take that one stream, enhance it with all of the elements that make up a typical Twitch, you know, program, and then I'll put that to Twitch. Now, would they use, when you say cloud, is it, it's a cloud receiver, are they using Matrix at that point, or are they just using the cloud receiver? No, that's not way? quite the same as Matrix. So that's really just what we call Cloud Connect, uh, not to get bogged <laughs> down in like, a, you know, live use specific product names, but Cloud Connect is just our ability to host the live you receive software in the public cloud live view hosting in other words our burdens on us you know we have to do all the worrying or host it in your vpc if you happen to be using a workflow that requires uh that uh software to be next door to the software you're going into an example of that might be software like visor t vector and inputting ndi into that i want to run that all on my aws vpc 
cloud connect as one product name covers both those use cases. Um, so yeah, that's, that's cloud connect matrix is the ability to take LRT and use it as a distribution protocol. So good example of that might be, uh, you know, a news network distributing content to all of their affiliates or a station group that's, you know, sharing content among all the different stations in the group or a rights holder who's, you know, producing a game and you've got a couple different outlets that you've sold those rights to and they want to pick it up from there. So that's where Matrix comes in. It's it's more of a, almost so, call it like an LRT CDN, right? The ability right. to take LRT, move it through the cloud, but go have it go to many different distribution points. So if you had a lot of um, partners that all had, let's say LU 2000s or LU 4000s, you could theoretically from Matrix, build a press pool for them, yeah. you know, so you're, Very you're taking one feed up, pools. you uplink. Now, and the other thing that's important is, is that the live use can take not only the cellular coverage, but of course bond in. What we've done a lot in the past is bonded in with ethernet, Wi-Fi, other things like that, where it, it's just a really, sometimes we've just used ethernet where it's just a convenient thing to do. Like it's convenient to put it, to give it an ethernet connection. And I don't have to think about how I'm going to transport it out on the other end. <laughs> like it's just, it's, you know, I could do something else, but I can just plug it in. Um, when they do the Mediterranean, uh, when they're out in the Mediterranean and cell service might be iffy, are they now using satellite um, into the live view? Because that's what we've done also, KA. Yeah. Kind of thing. I'm not sure if they've made this, this switch to some satellite. They did do a, we helped them with a kind of special setup on the sailboat where we were able to mount cellular antennas high up on the mast and then get a little more distance over the water back to towers on land. And apparently... I didn't know this. They they uh, inform me of this. The Mediterranean is a little unique in that there's so many pleasure boaters. There's fairly good cell coverage. They some <laughs> of the cell companies point the towers out to, you know, boats in the uh, coverage. But we have a lot of users using satellite today, especially Starlink. I mean, Starlink's become yep. super popular for it. I can think of, for example, one a similar streamer that does a Twitch show, and he does kind of more um outdoor adventures in australia so he's often in very very remote parts of australia and he's using starlink uh to back all that yeah yeah we we used in the past uh we our our kit that we used the live view for a lot was the live view with a ka so that we would have the ka coming in as over ethernet and that would be kind of filling in anywhere that we might not get cellular and then oftentimes we had a sat truck as well <laughs> so, so we had we kept them all all going for, for for larger events but uh but yeah so i was you know, i was interested when you were talking about the mediterranean whether they were using some kind of uplink because i know that we're finding that starlink is not it's one of those things like you still want cellular because it is Starlink still drops, you know, for us. Or, or bonding to Starlinks is the other popular you, uh, flow we're seeing now. So huh. to overcome the Starlink dips, if you bond two Starlinks together, often the timing of those dips is it cancel each other out. And so you can get a more, I won't say perfect, but mm. a more even feed out of yeah. two Starlink dishes uh, bonded together. Interesting. Um, next, next question. From Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What would be the most bare bones live view rig for an event? So I would say the most bare bones for an example would be the live view solo. We kind of briefly mentioned um, that is kind of all self-contained. You can uh, buy a solo. If you need cellular connectivity, we sell connectivity kits, meaning a couple of verified modems and data plans for it. And then you just all of the cloud services you need are kind of self-service and you can sign up right through the portal, choose an output and, and stream that, you know, to your final destination, both from a price tag and, and number of components needed. That's probably kind of a, a minimum. But we also make then when you move up to what can we internally consider the broadcast line, the LU300S, which is same form factor as a solo, but it's the pro unit that's got more features like comms. Uh, and and that ability to prioritize different connections if you're using LAN with cellular. We we make that available in uh, short-term and long-term rental as well as lease where we try to make it very simple to sort of figure out everything you need. Uh, everything all in in one price tag. The unit, if you're going to use a cloud receiver or if you're going to use a physical receiver, the data plan all kind of come in one price tag for the month to, to simplify it. Because Look again, full transparency. Our our product catalog could get a little deep and and complicated when you need different options like V mount versus you know Anton Bauer mount and car mount versus you know rack mount versus backpack portable and things like that. You can get a little lost in the weeds, but uh, we try to make it simple. If you're just looking for like kind of like like the uh, viewers asking for uh, what's the middle one to get started. 
I have to admit that for, we, we were doing so many events and at one point we had a couple of live views and we were still not having enough. And we were like, oh, we're gonna put this together ourselves. We're gonna get a pep link and you know, <laughs> we'll put this together. And we found very quickly how hard it is to get a bunch of cell, cell service to bond together because when you start building up the individual relationships as a user with the cell companies, it's it's not pretty. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a pretty ugly, ugly thing um, to to make work. Yeah, um, let us let us take that on with the with the cell companies, right? I mean, it's how do you deal long, with long term relationships with carriers? And... Yeah, how do you deal with? Um, so I've worked on a lot of uh, political campaigns, and they have you know the problem we really get into is there's three thousand people there, and then there's twelve live views, like just, you know for all the broadcasters. What's the best way to if you have a live view? What's the best way to approach that kind of problem? So one of the options here, it's a little exclusive to the U.S., but one of the options you have here in the U.S., for example, is AT&T, after they invested all the money to build what's called the FirstNet network, which is really for first responders, uh, they ended up with a cellular network that's capable of prioritization. So they make a level of prioritization available that's just a little bit below first responders, but it's above public. Um, and that's a big advantage to that kind of crowd scenario. Um, but and is just that something in general, you, is that something you get separately? I mean, is that something you call live you and say, I need that priority or I'm yeah, paying extra absolutely. for that? Just call us and say, well, I want to turn on priority and, and we can do it over the air, you know, to those, uh, Sims on the unit. Yeah. Cause um, parades, parades have been the one place where I go, Oh, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, for a planned event, the carriers are really good about bringing in additional bandwidth in the form of sell on wheels and, and, uh, making right. sure that a, you know, location can handle that. Parades are a classic example of like they generally don't have enough time to to get you know if it's if it's the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade they do but if it's a you know this team won the uh, World Series then then generally right. the the cell company is kind of like ah you know one week notice we're we're not bringing in cows uh, to to make that happen and that does get you know more challenging of course is everything that, that's in the live so the sell on wheels called cow, cow it's called a cow yeah you bring a cow in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but everything in the live view, live view is designed to, you know, help overcome that crowding scenario, including from other bonded cellular transmitters, right? So, uh, you know, you're trying to take advantage of, for example, that you might have two connections in the unit all on the same cell network, and that is giving you two unique IDs on that tower. So if it's all cell networks, you know, divide time between all the different connections in one of two ways, either time divisional or frequency divisional multiplexing you get two slices of that division um, per carrier uh, to get there. So that is designed to help as well. So the prioritization, uh, just having, you know, an 800 with eight, with six or eight connections and, and the latest software that we have on it are good advantages there too. Of course, if you can use LAN or Wi-Fi, the units support that, and that's always great too, uh, you know, to, to get on board. And, uh, one question about the studio is, is it possible for the, um, for the, uh, it, from the cloud to send that program feed back to the live view? Is that the, is that the, the same way you would normally do it? So it, it, there's a couple options there, right? The studio itself actually has a number of good monitoring options, multi-view, uh, and you can have a dedicated tab just for multi-view. So you can, of course, have multiple users in there. You can have one user that's just seen the multi-view. That's all delivered as WebRTC to the browser. So uh, it's very low latency. We have a video return feature in the units that can either bring video back as HDMI out of the unit, or you can see it on your cell phone. So if you have things plugged into your video return system back in uh, HQ, and you want to see that out of the unit, or you want to see that on your cell phone, you could do that as well. What we still need to do is kind of merge those two ideas. So we need a cloud input to our video return system. That is another feature just launching here at IBC. And then the you know you will have that ability to route kind of uh, out from studio into that video return feature. Another area where you know we both as as separate companies had kind of grown up some solutions for that, and now we just need to mash those two together. And and so with the four thousand, when you're putting a video return into it, you can send that to a cell phone. You can, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. <laughs> that would that would be very useful. Very useful <laughs> to know. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, next question from James Brooks in New York. What type of production and production team size are the specific prosumer live units uh, targeted towards? So um, definitely we have users that use multiple ones of those to do kind of a multi-camera production. Uh, that is an option. Each of those units, of course, is single input. So 
Alex was mentioning a little bit the OU 800. That is our multi-input uh, unit meant for kind of four camera production in a single unit. Um, so it just all you know depends on the total feature set you need uh, and what you're looking for. But on the prosumer side, if you're going to take multiple solos, go to a you know location, have a couple different cameras around the venue. You know maybe you're doing like an entertainment production. Let's you know use an example of like a concert. Have a few different cameras around the venue, and you're going to bring that back to a cloud platform like Studio, or bring it back to a physical platform, even like VMix, right? Then you can have each one streaming and and bring that back. There's some nuance differences there maybe not maybe nuance isn't quite the right word of, of the features you're going to get so lu 800 with multiple inputs all of the cameras are in perfect sync right solos is, is, the, it, is it the per- generally an lu 800 sending four 1080p is really just sending a 4k signal back right with them in quads actually no oh, so really? it, it is sending four separate streams i could talk, go into a whole talk about that why that was a better decision right because sending a 4k back we need a high peak of bandwidth all the time to send that 4k raster back at good quality mm. by sending four individual streams back we can make some prioritization decisions on uh, how much bandwidth to give each part of the frame and actually there's Got a whole it. interface in lu central in the 800 where you can say i know i'm going to have somewhat limited or i anticipate i'm going to have somewhat limited bandwidth here and i want this camera this is my main camera never let that fail but the other two cameras i could sacrifice mm. a little bandwidth on when the time comes and that's the advantage of sending model streams back but nonetheless because all the frames were made in the same encoder we can just label each frame as like this is frame one this is frame two and so all the frames are in perfect sync uh on the far side when you're using something like solo you're you know streaming from that unit you're passing through our elastic cloud that's the way solo works you may be bringing back srt let's say to vmix i can't tell you every one of those frames is going to be in perfect sync you know when you get it back so you know make it uh judgment accordingly and if you need some help you know talking to our our sales engineers to figure out exactly what you need there on what your expectations in terms of that production are if frame sync's not key then, then something like solo might be good if if frame sync is key then then we're going to move you up to the iu 800 what's the uh what are your recommendations related to latency i mean a lot of times if we're if, if i'm not interacting with someone i turn that latency up a bit um to make sure but if we're interacting we start turning it down but what, what are the kind of the ranges that and how you approach that so I would say that um, it's always, you know, it's great. The the method that you kind of outlined is great. Uh, you know, if you can give us more latency, this that's anybody not familiar with the live view system, that's the one um, value that the operator can change to change the resiliency. So we take a lot of the more complex decision making of when to try to resend a packet or when to use even a dynamic resolution and then resize on the other side as a way to combat low bandwidth and and still get a very good looking signal on the other side all of that's automatic and all that's under the hood but the thing you could control is to say i can deal with two seconds of latency here as alex said because i'm not talking to somebody or, or doing interactivity um and therefore with two seconds of latency we have more options for resiliency. we can resend more packets we can make more decisions a lot of our customers standardize right around 1.2 seconds uh you know as as the latency that they're dialing in and that's glass to glass so in the our our store our primary use case of the unit to an LU2000 4000 physical receiver outputting SDI imagine that SDI plugged into a monitor from the glass of the camera to the glass of the monitor it's 1.2 seconds which is i think 1.2 is because that's about the latency of a satellite <laughs> yeah hey, so i like, think our I, new I customers that. were we're very comfortable with it right like they know it you can set all the way down on m- all the modern units and on modern software to 800 milliseconds over bonding. And you can set lower if you're over, if you know you're going to be over something like LAN, um, you can set down to 500 milliseconds. So uh, you can set a, a lower latency. We have some customers that are just kind of doing, you know, some of our large deploy news customers that have just done a lot of extensive testing and just made that decision of like, hey, we think we can go from 1.2 to 1 now because. 5G networks and even more so LTE networks have become so reliable. There's enough in the U.S. and we just feel good about it. And they've kind of made that decision to move down a little bit. Um, but yeah, it depends what you can tolerate too. You know, in terms of the the shot, if you can give us more, that's that's definitely better. There's more resiliency to be had there. Right. Next question from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul asks: Is there a trade-in or upgrade program to go from Live View Solo? The LiveView Solo Pro. So 
we, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk just briefly about that. We thought long and hard about it. We wanted to do a trade-in program. Uh, and then we kind of thought of some advantages of doing it a little bit different way. One, uh, we wanted you to be able to keep the unit, um, use it as a backup, even resell it, you know, to, to get a little more money because we do support resales on, on just the solo line. It's a little different than the LU300, LU800 line uh, in terms of that. So we thought it over and we thought, well, we don't we don't want to get a lot of these units back. We want the user to keep those, even if they just keep it as a backup or as a chance to resell it. And we came up instead with what we call the loyalty program. So if you are a solo owner and you purchase a pro and you register that pro in, in the solo portal, we'll detect that automatically and we'll give you a $250 credit towards any of the services that you then buy, like the ability to use bonding, data, uh, we're just about to launch a new service uh, in the next couple of weeks here that um, does uh, multi-destination output from that portal. So any of those services that are an add-on that $250 credit applies to. And again, it just happens automatically when you register the pro in the portal uh, and you keep the old unit. So you, again, back up, sell it on eBay, you know, whatever value you want to get out of that. Next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has a question. When using Live View Studio to bring in multiple cameras or video sources into a production, what are the settings and tools to assign identical latency to each source for the purpose of sync for the output? So in the, the new feature where you're bringing LRT in, you can control the latency. Of course, we were just discussing that glass to glass latency that's built into LRT right in studio. Or, of course, you can still see the units in Live View Central and adjust the, the latency there, make sure they're all set the same. Probably a little easier in studio to kind of go right down your sources, make sure they're all the same. If you're using third-party sources to come in, then, then the options are going to be different. So SRT has deterministic latency, and you would be able to set it even to the same as what you set at LRT to, right? Like if you were using one second as the latency in LRT, you could take all of your SRT encoders and set it to the same RTMP, unfortunately, is not deterministic latency. So TCP-based protocol. Yeah, can you can define determin determin de <laughs> determinative latency? Deterministic latency meaning ju uh, just that whatever latency you set, the protocol will make its best effort to keep that exactly. So LRT, I'm proud to say, is, is very, very good at it. If you set one second, we will never you know, go plus or minus that. SRT, as I understand it, and I'm not a SRT uh, part of the SRT development team, but we, you know, we we use a lot of SRT is very close, but not always perfect. So if you set a deterministic latency of 800 milliseconds, let's say, and they recommend setting, if you're not trying to do sync like this person's asking about, they recommend setting somewhere around two to three times your round trip time on the network uh, as a resiliency technique. But let's say you set 800 milliseconds, as we understand it is you know, plus minus a few milliseconds uh, to get there. But RTMP, you, you can control a certain amount of latency through some very advanced settings of buffer depth on either side, send and receive buffers. But because it's a TCP-based protocol, uh, what happens is the latency actually changes slightly over the course of the stream as the buffers increase or decrease. I know that sounds weird because you think to yourself, video playback you know, it, it's very fixed. You know, each frame is played, you know, the same amount of time, but it just changes just enough that you don't visually see it in the stream, but it does change the amount of delay between the uh, the encoder and the other side. So with RTMP, there's really no tricks you have to to set that kind of consistent latency. Across. Well, and when it's shifting, does it just speed up and slow down or is it losing frames or you know, just throwing frames so it, away? Really, both things can happen, right? One, it can, uh, depending on the player, it can choose to play a frame for either a little longer, a little shorter than it normally would, but it can also drop frames, you know, uh, in terms of the playback. Next question. From John Fisher in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Being from Oklahoma, I'm most familiar with Live View for storm chasers. How does the system fail over to lower capacity networks when traveling through rural areas? And do users have to plan for it? Uh, so when we talk about the cell networks in terms of upgrade and downgrade of uh, connection technology, so if you start out on 5G and then you drive off and now you're in an LTE zone and then you keep driving and maybe even fall down to like a true 4G HSPA plus zone or something like that, um, no, that all happens automatically, even really in the modem. We take some control over it in the, in our software, but the modem itself is making some decision making about you know when to upgrade and downgrade across those different technologies. 
Uh, I'll say that all cell networks, just a uh, you know a property of cell networks, is they're more aggressive about downgrade than they are about upgrade. I guess that makes some sense, but <laughs> you know they'll 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 quickly decide, hey, LTE is not working. I'm going to try the next one down, and then once you move back into like a great LTE or 5G coverage zone, they're sluggish to to get back up to you know that other technology. And you, if you're really concerned about that. What happens in, the, in a live view unit is you can take some manual control there because you can individually control each modem, for example, temporarily turn one off, which actually powers down the whole modem, turn it back on so that it gets a whole fresh connection to it. You don't usually have to do that. I'm not saying that that's a technique you have to go out there and do, but if you're an advanced user and you're doing something advanced like storm chasing, then you, at least you've got that manual control if you want it. But, but generally speaking, upgrade and downgrade through different zones happens automatically. Are you able to use a live view uh, device as an internet connection, just a straight internet connection? So it depends on the device. Forward, but there's yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So so there is a feature, and it, it's a it's a separately licensed feature for the three hundred and eight hundred six hundred and eight hundred called Data Bridge. That is a true two way IP mode. There's also a feature um, when we're talking about remote production called IP pipe. That so Data Bridge you put the unit into that mode exclusively. You just do two-way IP, right? IP pipe happens simultaneously with video and uh, it's designed if you need some two-way IP as part of remote production. So the key example would be like PTZ camera control, right? Or maybe you're using IP-based intercom. uh, And then you you need that at the same time you're doing the, you know, primary audio and video, turn on IP pipe and that will give you a two-way layer two bridge. And and so then the, the... The four thousand or two thousand in the office is connected to the LAN. Or, That's right. Know, yeah, got it. Okay, and then the, and so they're take your PTZ it. controller, plug it into a little switch, you know, on the other side of the, the two thousand or four thousand out in the field. Take your PTZ camera, plug it into the Ethernet port of the um, LU eight hundred. Take the SDI or HDMI output of the PTZ camera and still plug that into the HDMI or SDI input of the LU eight hundred. And now you're remotely controlling. Uh, the PTZ camera while you're getting encoded audio and video. And what uh, kind of bandwidth do you get over that? So IP pipe, that was a differentiation to make. IP pipe was meant to be kind of low bandwidth because we want to reserve a lot still for the audio and video. Um, And so, we, you know, somewhere around one megabit is what we recommend. Sure. Part max, you know, to send over IP pipe. Data bridge, uh, you'll get higher bandwidth. It, you know, two-way IP not our specialty so it's it's not the focus of the units if if there's other two-way ip products out there that i will be transparent about will outperform us on just pure two-way ip right uh, when it comes to multiple connections and then uh just a feature we've got coming down the road although won't won't quite be ibc it'll be a little further down the road is a kind of hybrid of those two so a version of ip pipe where we can go even higher than one megabit we call it data bridge internally we call it data bridge at the same time as live but Basically, just take that same IP pipe concept and say, opportunistically, use as much bandwidth as you can. So if we have way more than one meg available, you know, as as two-way IP, go ahead and use it as as two-way IP while simultaneously doing audio and video encoding. And if I'm sending that control to that PTZ, am I relating to the IP number of the 4,000 or 2,000? So I, I, or is it, could I, do I have multiple IPs? How is it bridging the network across that? So in that physical example like that, it's it's a true layer two bridge, right. uh, meaning it's Ethernet frames, you know, the, that are bridged between the two. So you can have an entire IP network that happens to span, right. you know, with that bridge in the middle, use as many IP addresses as you want. When you're using it in the cloud, it's a little different only because VPCs don't forward uh, layer two. So then it's got to be a layer three bridge and, and you've got to get, you know, a specific set of IPs. Got it. Uh, next question. From Douglas Carmichael, from looking at pictures of your server matrix units, they seem to be based on OEM Dell servers. Do you have plans to offer a server as a virtual appliance for customers with existing virtual infrastructures? They are, we do indeed use a lot of Dell, uh, OEM Dells as, as the servers could catch on that. They're very nice servers. We do, so I, I briefly mentioned Cloud Connect, and that's our the ability to take our software and, and run that uh, either where we host it or run it in your own VPC. That same license and software image could be run on your own hypervisor if you're running VMware internally or something like that. 
as chance would have it, I I don't know of any customer doing it that way. So we have a lot of customers running it in a VPC, you know, in, in the public cloud. Um, I don't know of any customers using it in their own hypervisor instance, but the same software idea and, and license and image would would certainly apply there. I, we do it a lot internally for development and, and QA reasons, but we just haven't had a customer that's used it that way. Well, I, I forgot to ask what the cost structure is for uh, the studio product. How do you so charge for studio that? product is uh, based on hours produced. Uh, so it, there's a kind of entry package that's aimed at what we think the most common you know number of production hours a month is. That's probably right where you need to start unless you're really banging out a lot of content, you know, a heavy producer, uh, and then goes up from there in terms of the the total number of hours. So it's you know you would determine how many hours a month you really need to use, and and then uh, that's how the pricing structure works. Yeah, because I can really see it. You, I mean, one of the things that we have done, we do a lot in our system is just safety. So this is where you can have those. So we have a, a, oftentimes we have a live view coming in that could go directly to the cloud, but it goes through our hardware so that I have slides, videos, other things. I also can, one of the things that's important for me is to be able to turn the remote location off. So, hey guys, you have five minutes, you know, they need five minutes. They, I just want to give them 10 minutes or five minutes. So I've got some playback that I can run outside of their system so that they can reset, move, do whatever they're doing, manage whatever's there. And, I, and right now we're doing it with hardware, but I can see how this could be a really good product for just because I guess you can also, one thing we didn't talk about, you have inputs. How do you load in playback into the studio? So playback, you can load in uh, a couple different formats of video files. You can build playlists, uh, and then you can use that as one of the inputs. So you can switch to that in the vision mix mode, or you can fall back to that uh, if uh, you know a primary signal goes away. So we definitely have some customers that would use it in what we think of as like a cloud MCR use case, where they're not really doing true sit in front of the switcher production with it they're doing mcr like switching with it right, right. if this signal just kind of as you were outlined if this signal goes away i fall back to this other live signal if that signal goes away i can fall back to this playlist and and make sure i've got something going to air that's that's a popular use case for it um and then you, you kind of made me think of the way you were describing it we also have a lot of customers that have a full production studio and and a physical board and, and are doing production there, but they're very interested in disaster recovery, right? So what do they right. what do they do the day that uh, you know they're locked out again because of the next pandemic, you know, from that room or or that room uh, goes down, you know, powers out for the whole city, sort of thing. Some of our customers worry about that kind of. I'm in Northern recovery. California. We worry about fires all the time. <laughs> there you go. See? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, ne next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, wants to know, can you start and stop your live view solo plan at any time? Solo plans, you can, yeah. So the definitely the LU300 and above, the kind of broadcast plans um, are a little different. Uh, and, and you know, we're, some of those involve uh, commitments and, and uh, full contracts there. But specifically for that prosumer market, we understood you've got to be able to start and stop anytime you want. So any one of the services that comes along with solo, you can stop at any time. The smallest quantum we do is one month. So if you've got a one week production in that, you do have to subscribe to the whole month, but you can click cancel right away. It'll run out that month. If you've got an off season with sports an off season from school, or you just know you're, you've got ebb and flow workflow and you know, you've got no work coming up in the next 30 days, cancel everything, save the money, start it again at the other side. Next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA, asking, Dan, what is the latest in the prosumer-oriented solo product line as far as hardware, features, and services? So end of last year, you know, it's funny. We we That product line, of course, is based on our same hardware that we use for the, the pro product line. Um, and for seven years, we ran the LiveView Solo, which was based on what used to be called the LU200 H264-based encoder. Uh, and then... The pro product line had long switched to HEVC based encoding, originally with the LU600 and then with the LU300 and the LU800. And finally, at the end of last year, we launched the Solo Pro, which is based somewhat on the LU300S hardware platform with some hardware modifications to focus it in on that prosumer market. For example, it takes USB C in for the power, unlike the 300S, which still takes the you know, barrel connector for the power. Um, but that's and that's now based on that full same hardware platform, HEVC encoding, although it's H.264 capable as well. Uh, two and a half hour plus battery life, same battery that's in the 300S. 
Um, and then we expanded the total number of modems you can connect to it. So you used to be able to only connect two modems to the solo. Now you can connect four modems to the solo uh, for a total of six connections, four modems plus LAN plus Wi-Fi. And that, again, unit launched around October last year. So in my mind, it's still relatively new. I know in the world of consumer electronics, things move a little faster. But in my mind, you know, after seven years of life out of the original platform, that's still our, our new guy. And uh, that's that'll be our go forward platform. 4K capable. 4KP60 encoding in H.264 or HEVC. Uh, so do 4K to YouTube, you know, right from that platform. Next question. Jesse Mills in San Francisco Bay Area asking, which Live View units have an inbuilt video recorder? So that's a feature of the broadcast product line. LU300S up uh, have the ability to automatically record um, and then do uh, store and forward. You mentioned that mode, you know, just briefly before. So you can do where you're not transmitting live and you're just recording. And then we'll try to send that file as fast as we can, even simultaneous to the live, but it's still a file send. It's not a true transmission or um, a feature called live in store where you're doing the live stream, but we're also recording to the unit. And then it's at two different qualities. So if, of course, the live stream is reactive to the amount of bandwidth that you have, if you happen to take a dip in bandwidth and we have to scale down the quality a little bit to do that, the file that's recorded to the unit is a consistent bit rate and quality the whole time. So that starts at 300 S and, and up 300 S 600, 800 all have that feature. Next question. From Mickey Makachur in Manila, Philippines, could a system similar to pipeline blocking, locking or output locking be implemented in Live View Studio to ensure that multiple sources utilizing various protocols will align in sync, perhaps with the help of a GPS-based longitudinal timecode receiver and generator. That's you know, it's it's a feature we've spent a lot of time on internally. Um, it, I mean, you kind of mentioned G, GPS as the source of that time there. That's really PTP time for those that are familiar with different time protocols. Uh, one of the things we did e even some time ago was kind of a deep dive into is the NTP protocol, which on paper isn't resolute enough to do frame sync, actually in practice, always resolute enough to, to do frame sync. The answer is yes, right? You have to really be in a bad network condition before NTP is not resolute enough to do frame sync. So yes, that feature is coming. Uh, and and of course, it, we're working on adding it. There's a lot of support for it across the industry, I think, too, where you see more and more cloud platforms accepting timestamps inside the elementary streams to align frames. And we'll get to a point where a lot more cloud platforms are in sync. We're going to get there. I'll, I'll even be transparent and say we're maybe a little slow getting there. I, I wish we'd gotten there a little faster, but we're, we're going to get there. Uh, and then it'll, you know you'll get it from both our encoders and from other encoders, and and generally I think the industry is really catching up to removing this stuff around as IP now SRT NDI LRT and and the way to do frame sync is the way to have these timestamps in each of the streams. As you look forward to IBC, um, do, can you tell us a little bit, give a little preview of what you're planning to talk about there? Yeah, so it, we'll definitely have studio there if anybody wants to stop by and get that full demo. Uh, that'll have the 12 inputs is the kind of big new feature that we're talking about there. You'll be able to have a chance to see LRT input and output, of course, on studio for that. Um, in the rest of the live view ecosystem, we'll be showing off what we call the mobile receiver there. That's the ability to plug a LU 800 into the back of an LU 4000. We've been talking a lot about receiver and actually receive over cellular as well. So that if you don't have internet, wherever your server is. Um, they, then you can stream from a unit to that server over in both cellular and both ends of the equation um, and have the, the receiver be remote. So we'll be showing that off. Uh, and then we always have a kind of a multi-cam demo with IP pipe working. So if you want to see how you can move a PTC camera and have four inputs going to the 800 and uh, do that kind of prioritization, we talked a little bit about the beginning of this is my main camera. I don't want to lose that one. And here's the other two. All of those demos there at, uh, at IBC. That's great. Uh, next question. Jeff Keithley in Texas, where is the eight input backpack? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, had, it had to come up. <laughs> that one comes up, or I'm sure at IBC we'll get it again. Every now and then we'll we'll get a couple of users to stop by and ask about 8K, which, which actually we did have a user in Japan do 
um, 8K with four LU800s and the frames in sync across all four LU800s. So how do they? How do you sync those up? So that's the we talked a little bit about syncing with GPS, but you could, can you sync multiple LUs on the same site together? So the, this user was able to do it with uh, some additional hardware in the workflow. Uh, like a frame stick on the far side to let them make slight adjustments to the the frames. But yes, when we get to that timestamp feature that the uh, previous caller was just asking about, right, you'll be able to do disparate units at that point. And therefore, you'd be able to have, for example, two LU-800s both doing four camera and therefore eight cameras all in sync, you know, through right. two units. But it, the same would apply to 4K. So if you did four 4K streams, even though there's that's four units, units and and, right. and SDI one will do 12G. So you, you you only have to put it in. So you're just using the SDI one for all four units to and then building the quad. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Got it. Next question. From Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Roscoe asked, I recently used a T-Mobile gateway to push a 1080p concert to Facebook live. Field test the day before showed 35 to 45 megabytes per second. Upload speeds. What are the dangers of using a consumer 5G connection from a static location? So you've got a couple of things there. I mean, one, there's no, e even with a service like AT&T's prioritization, it's not giving you a true um, total bandwidth quality of service. In other words, you're not able to say, I have to have 20 megabits all the time. Guarantee that to me. That is, There is a cellular technique for that called 5G slicing. It isn't widely available yet uh, and, you know, hasn't really productized, made it as a productized offering to the, the market yet, but it's something that we're keeping an eye on. So the risk with any wireless network is that the bandwidth is going to change over time based on the number of people that connect to it and based on some other RF uh, conditions that might change, right? You're doing a concert. They roll in a bunch of uh, sound gear, wireless mics, all of that to the stage. While those are different frequencies and everything, it adds energy to the air and it changes the RF environment uh, that you're in. So what, what, of course, we've seen over 16 years of working with cellular networks is that you often have this unpredictable bandwidth uh, coming from it. And while it's gotten more predictable in LTE and, and 5G, it's just hard to, to guarantee it. What bonding is doing for you, of course, is taking more than one connection and making sure that if you've got a valley in one and a peak in the other, you're, you're definitely putting those together into uh, a more secure connection, especially as something like a concert where you're going to have a big crowd come in. We were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier and all of them use their cell phones, you know, all, all the viewers at the concert whip out their cell phones and try to take a few pictures, send a few texts, maybe even get on Facebook live themselves or something, then that's going to change the RF environment. And, and it's going to be hard to guarantee that, that bandwidth. So what a lot of our users are looking for is, guaranteed like bandwidth out of what are inherently not guaranteed networks, right? And that's where all of these techniques that we've kind of been discussing play a role. Are the live views uh, location-based? So, um, so for instance, I need to get a different live view. Do I need to get a different live view from the United States versus Europe? So generally anymore, the answer is no. Like the knock on wood, the industry has gotten very good about the modems, and while there's still a lot of frequencies, different channels used all around the world, the modems have gotten better about connectivity all around the world. Uh, and so it's become much more standardized in terms of we used to be a lot more in that boat of there was a European unit, and US unit, things like that. But now you can take a US unit to Europe, use it anytime you want. In fact, all of our units, the all of the broadcast units in the US, 300, 600, 800, come with... Um, international sims in what we call row b so they're they're also capable of two sims per modem with a switch over between the two just like your two sim cell phone and in row b we put in these international sims you can activate that as a temporary roaming plan take your same unit on a plane get off in europe turn on the roaming plan you know for a month stream from europe and then and then come back to the u.s so that's gotten a lot better even in just the last four or five years i would say where uh, the units can be used all over we've got much better international data, the ability for one SIM to provide, you know, data anywhere. Um, and now it's, it's much smoother than it used to be. Uh, one more question. And it's from Eduardo Augustine in Panama City. Panama, can we incorporate live solo to the rest of the live view studio? You can. So um, definitely, if you want to use 
solo as the uh, encoder and then studio as your vision mixer, that that's definitely an option. Um, yeah, absolutely. Dan, so thank you so much for your time. It's really great yeah. to have you here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the questions. Really appreciate. <laughs> we really grilled you here. So, so it's, it's, <laughs> hope I got them all. <laughs> we try to we try to warn people. It's a it's a hard hour. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of questions. So really really excited. We're we're going to be using the live view next week at at Seagraph and uh, and so we're we're excited to awesome. be. Uh, and the tests have been going really well. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, thanks to the panel for the great conversation before and and during the, the second hour. And thanks to the producers asking all these questions. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier when everyone all over the world is asking these questions as opposed to just us trying to figure out what to ask. Uh, all the different perspectives make a big difference. Uh, thanks to the incredible team, a small village that gets up every day to make this uh, show actually happen. There's a production team and the management team and the development team uh, to make all this possible. And we really appreciate your contribution. Uh, we traveled uh, 104,000 miles today uh, through these questions. Uh, that's uh, 168,000 kilometers. And that is 831 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. Thanks, Dan. That was great. Yeah, thank you. It was really well good. Done. I, I have to, I'll have to send you pictures of the, uh, the crazy setup we've built because we've got the ambisonic mic and we've got the, and then we're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> embedding it all into the uh, thing. I'll, I'll send you a photo. It's, it's kind of. Yeah, cool. that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's good. All right, I'm jumping. Thanks. Thank you.